Hi everyone! In this lecture we are going to talk about the most crucial, the most important part of entrepreneurial process – business model validation. So what it is? Uh, if you remember, entrepreneurial thinking, uh, entrepreneurial thinking is not a linear process. It happens in a loop. We start with inspiration, we proceed to understanding our stakeholders and understanding the problem in all its complexity. This is where we conduct interviews, we try to understand uh, all essential elements that the solution will have, all the essential elements um, through which we can formulate attractive value propositions to all our stakeholders to get them on board. Then we design. We design a solution, we design a business model. Now, the important part of that is after the designing part is over, after you develop the first minimal viable product, after you develop the first prototype even, after you develop the first ideas about your business model, what is going to be your price, what are going to be your revenues, how you are going to do R&D and so on, you have to go and validate it. Validation is the only way of dealing, is the, is the only real way of dealing with entrepreneurial uncertainty. So, you validate, you test the key assumptions that underpin your business model, that underpin your solution design. And in most cases, after validation, you have to get back to getting stakeholders' insights and update. Update your solution, update your business model up until the validation happens completely uh, and you can start implementing it. We can draw a chart. On the one axis, we can uh, have, on the x-axis, we can have the degree of validation. How much work did you put towards testing all the key elements of your business model? And the more validation you do, the more, the less uncertainty in, is left in your venturing idea. Is it a corporate venture? Is it a new venture? You have to validate what you have developed. And the more validation you do, the less uncertainty is left there, up to the level that well, my rule of thumb is the following. Um, what are the key questions to which you have to get bulletproof answers to be confident enough to go to a bank and get home equity loan in order to uh, finance your own idea? If you yourself are not, well, going, going to a bank and getting new, uh, home equity loan for entrepreneurial idea, in us usually it is not the best way to pursue, but it is more a thinking tool. Are you yourself confident enough in your idea? If no, then keep on validating, keep on going in this circle. What is even more important, the lower the remaining uncertainty is related to your entrepreneurial project, the higher is your venture value. Um, so if you come to a venture capitalist with just a basic idea that uh, here is a problem and I have some, some ideas about solution, what is the price of your venture? What will be the venture value when you didn't do any valid validation yet? Well, it is essentially zero. Uh, we really need good ideas, but these ideas are... Uh, there is quite a few of them. Uh, there is abundance of good ideas. What we really need is validated ideas. And that's the essence, what, that's the key element of entrepreneurial design loop. And you will notice uh, today's lecture, it is much shorter than the lecture, for example, on business model design or on solution design, because those design um, systems require a lot of elements, you have to fill in a lot of boxes. Validating is simple but not easy. It is, um, the basic idea is formulate the major questions, major assumptions that underpin your business model and then go out and test them. Uh, so, it is easy to explain, but ultimately you have to do a lot of work. Most of the work in entrepreneurial thinking process happens at validation stage. Uh, so again, going back here, plan your best, which is why we design first, before testing, before getting minimal viable product or even prototype to our potential customers, we have to, um, we have to plan our best. The design has to make sense. But ultimately, we have to acknowledge that in most cases, initial ideas will not work and we will have to adjust them. We have to fail, fail cheap and learn quickly and pivot if we need to. That's the essence of validation. Uh, so, validating business model validation. Uh, you can present your business model using any framework that is convenient to you. Business model canvas, uh, my four quadrant framework, lean, lean startup canvas, whatever, whatever is convenient for you. Look at your business model and then think about what are the key hypotheses 
that underpin your business model design? What are the crucial assumptions that you have to test? Uh, so validating the target industry, it is all about, is the industry large enough? Maybe the industry is small. Is the industry approachable? Is the market approachable? What are the entry barriers? Maybe the whole industry is monopolized by somebody else and you simply cannot get there. That's what you do when you validate the industry. Validating the value proposition is all about um, the problems that you want to solve to your most important stakeholders are real. Uh, and your solution is perceived as the one that solves those problems. So uh, validating the value proposition is all about um, talking to your stakeholders, interviewing them, conducting interviews and surveys in order to show them what you have to offer to them and see whether it makes sense to them or not. If not, you have to get back to drawing board because unless you can get on board all crucial stakeholders, your idea will not see the light of the day. Validating the business model design is validating all the key elements of this uh, third quadrant, all the validating the revenue streams, making sure that price is adequate, that revenue is achievable. Validating the R&D model is all about uh, making sure that your plans for R&D, for development of your cr crucial components of your solution, that they are doable. For this, usually, you would have to show your prototype to, um, for example, if you are thinking about software, some software startup, you have to show your prototype, your wireframes to developers and see whether it is implementable, how much it will cost, and how, how long it will take. This is how you validate your R&D model. Validating the production model is all about validating validating that. For example, if you're thinking about that somebody in China will produce the stuff for you, finding this somebody in China, talking to them, making sure that they can deliver on those promises. Uh, validating their um, go-to-market model is testing whether your channel to reach your customers is reachable. You can do it using, for example, you can do a pilot launch and see whether your cost of customer acquisition is precisely as you expected. Uh, or you can talk to industry experts, you can talk to a marketing company, you can do lots of things to validate your um, go-to-market model. We, we, of course, we are going to discuss uh, practical approaches a little bit later. Finally, resources for the business model. Validating the resources is all about making sure that you can acquire the necessary resources. It is all about that you can develop them or you can buy them or you can lease them from somebody. And this is what you do when you validate your business model. You talk to those resource providers and you see, is it realistic or not? And if it is not, if your hypotheses are rejected, uh, or you cannot find hard evidence that the hypothesis will be supported, you usually have to get back to the drawing board and try to adjust your business model, try to adjust your solution in such a way that it will actually, uh, it will pass the validation stage. As an entrepreneur or as a, as a leader, entrepreneurial leader, you yourself are the most interested person to get objective data from validation. Because if the model works on paper but doesn't work in real world, it means that you didn't validate it well enough. It's better to fail at this validation stage and to get back to drawing board at validation stage rather than try to implement something that is, uh, is dead upon arrival. So, validating the business model is crucial. Uh, of course, the more you validate, this is your homework as an entrepreneur. You have to validate it and you will have to convey all these ideas to investors when you pitch to investors, but most first and foremost to you yourself. Um, I recommend to be quite systematic in this approach. I recommend to have a business model validation plan um, in entrepreneurial thinking uh, course projects, I actually require, I want to see this plan because I want to make sure that the entrepreneurial teams have thought through all essential things that underpin their business models. Furthermore, when you start developing financial projections, you will find out that there are some assumptions, for example, cost of customer acquisition or R&D costs that you don't know yet, but you still have to put some numbers in financial projections. Make sure that those numbers, validating those numbers, those reasonable estimates that you put in financial projections are also available in this table. So you can always say that I assume that my cost of customer acquisition is, for example, $20 because this was cost of customer acquisition in prior ventures in this industry. 
but also you will have to um, have a hypothesis about um, about your go-to-market strategy somewhere in validating the business model design saying that cost of acquiring customer is whatever you put in your financial projections so business model validation plan put here all the essential hypothesis that underpin your business model initial segment exists is all about well you have to do your homework and see whether whether there is enough customers or initial niche is approachable look at through regulatory requirements and see whether you can actually get access to that niche uh, validating the value proposition is all about testing that the problem is there that the proposed solutions resolve the problem which basically you need for example that's why you need prototype because prototype or minimal viable product actually allows you to have a check mark here that the proposed solution solves the problem and so on so business model validation plan i i strongly recommend to put all your key assumptions in this table usually you will have 15 to 20 key assumptions for testing then you're thinking about testing approach for each of those assumptions and then you would put cost and what's most important you will see that in the absolute majority of cases you can test all your business model at zero cost or at at really with a re really small budget maybe if you are doing pilot launch you will need some money in order to test yeah, your business model functioning in, in a pilot mode but in most cases validation costs almost nothing uh, once you fill in this table you will yourself be surprised how e cheaply it is to test your business model this is the key idea of failing early and failing cheap at the at the at the stage of validation validation of the business model of course investments into business model validations are usually the best way to spend seed money this is what a lot of engineering new ventures don't get uh, usually engineering founders want to invest all the seed money that they can get into r d into developing their product and improving it but the best way to spend your seed money limited seed money that you might have is for validation because this is where you can see that maybe you don't need to develop that product maybe there is no way you, you're going to market it anyway so let's talk about testing approaches how can we test things that for example that overall business model design is profitable or that the price is adequate and so on there are lots of testing approaches the most important ones are six that i have listed here first secondary data analysis do your homework uh, read all the industry reports analysis periodicals that you have things like that uh, initial niche size you can always get it from secondary data plus data from domain experts means talk to a couple of people uh, who already tried things in this industry or who already worked in this industry and experienced this problem and pitch your idea to them see whether it will find uh, whether it will work with them or not so secondary data analysis is your homework this is what you definitely have to do second we get to primary data primary data is collecting the data yourself something that you cannot read elsewhere uh, you can observe you can actually take a look at what customers are doing and see that out of 100 customers that you observed 50 experienced this problem and did something that you're trying to solve we can conduct survey or we can conduct interviews and focus groups what's important at the stage of business model validation we are talking about numbers we need to be able to talk about statistics so if at the stage of empathic analysis of stakeholders we um, prioritized deep insights over numbers we had uh, we asked the why questions five times we had open-ended questions and long interviews at this stage we actually need to have numbers we need to have hundreds and hundreds of observations in order to see out of 1000 potential customers 500 are really willing to buy our solution once it is available so uh, stakeholder primary data collection at this stage we are talking about a lot a lot uh, a lot of responses third is prototyping prototyping is the way to test the technical feasibility of your solution and prototyping is one of the best ways to convey what you are doing to your stakeholders for your surveys interviews and focus groups number four rim limited rollout or pilot launch this is the most one of the most sure ways to test that your business model works 
For example, if you're starting something in the whole United States, you can always launch a pilot, for example, in Massachusetts or somewhere in Arizona. See how it works. It will give you all the numbers that you need in order to scale up nationally in the United States. All the things like cost of customer acquisition, customer lifetime value, R&D time and costs, and so on, all of this you will see from limited rollout. So if there is a way to do a pilot launch, you have to do it. Uh, also, something that is really getting popularity these days is crowdfunding. If you are uh, developing something that is tangible, so if you are selling some electronic things, you can always try to create a Kickstarter or a similar crowdfunding platform uh, campaign and see are people willing to pay for this thing or not? Are they getting excited about this thing or not? This is one of the ways to validate a business model. And finally, analyzing projecting financial statements is all about making Excel spreadsheets, making sure that your model works at least on paper. If it doesn't work on paper, it will not work in practice as well. So these are six ma major ways to test your hypothesis that underpin your business model. If we go back to this table, the testing approach, this is what you write in the testing approach table, in the testing approach column. I strongly recommend to fill in this table. Of course, you will not show it to investors when you pitch to investors, but if you have this table and if you systematically conducted experiments or analyzed data in order to validate your business model, you will have hard answers, hard evidence answering all the concerns and questions of the investors. Now, validating with a primary customer. The key test is do your primary customers want it or not? If no, then everything else ultimately will simply not matter. In case if you are doing a business to customer project, one of the best ways to test your idea in B2C settings is customer survey. Of course, if we are talking about B2B, um, in most cases, you will not collect hundreds of answers. If you have just a couple of responses from uh, potential customers in business sector, that's enough. But in B2C, there is no reason for not collecting hundreds of responses in order to actually run some statistical uh, analysis and see whether your idea actually resonates with the primary customers. How I recommend to conduct this survey? Well, I recommend to have two pages, or in electronic form, it will still be first electronic page, page one, and then um, page two with your questions. Page number one, explain what your company is doing. So business name is, what is your name of the business? Like Alpha is solving the problem of, and clearly explain your problem. It is different from alternatives because of explain how you're going to be different. The major benefits that we promise are and then say what we are promising. So basically three sentences that summarize your value proposition. You can say them, you, you can state them orally if you are conducting an interview uh, or you can just write them up on, on the first page of your survey. At the same stage on page one, you have to show a simple graphical description of the solution. That's why you need those diagrams, prototypes, wireframes, images of the final product. One of the reasons we do prototyping is because we need to clearly communicate and get feedback from the customers. This is where you put your prototype. So page number one, value proposition to primary customers and a prototype or a diagram how this whole thing will look like so that they immediately understand what you're doing, your solution. And then page number two is questionnaire. So. Let me give you some ideas, some of the typical questions that I personally usually put in such surveys. Question number one is usually, it will compose of a couple of other questions, is demographics. So uh, whatever you have to capture in terms of your segmentation, so are you targeting, what gender are you targeting, what socioeconomic status, what, which occupation you're targeting, put it there. Question number one is just about demographics of a respondent. Question number two, now we are getting to details. Our product service is intended to solve the following problem. Just repeat what has been said in the first page. Do you experience this problem in your life? Of course, feel free to rephrase, but that's the whole idea. Are you a potential customer 
for our solution. But I would not ask whether you are a potential customer, because maybe they already are using some other solution, so they will say, no, I am not a potential customer, but not because they don't have a problem, but more rather because they already have some solution that they like. So I would usually ask, do you f feel this pain? Is this your problem or not? Question number three. Crucial. How satisfied are you with the current products and services that you use now for solving this problem? Uh, your solution might be super superior, but if the customers are satisfied or very satisfied with what they have, the chances are high that they will not pay attention to what you're offering. It is like cell phone services. I have a feeling that I overpay for my cell phone, particularly after moving from the United States to Canada, I have a feeling that what I'm paying here for my to my cell phone operator is much more than I would pay for similar services there in the United States. But generally speaking, I am I feel myself satisfied with the pro with the current solution to my problem. And these satisfied and very satisfied people, it is almost impossible without major marketing efforts, without major cost of customer acquisition, it is more, almost impossible to force them to switch to your solution. So if out of 100 customers, 80 say that, yes, they have this problem, but out of this 80, 65 say that they are happy with the current solutions, it might be a non-starter. Unless you are Apple and you have billions of dollars to invest into marketing, there is a chance that you will not be able to overcome this um, bounded rationality of your customers. They simply cannot make op op optimal decisions in all aspects of their life. As long as they are happy, satisfied or very satisfied, there is a chance that you will not get there. Now, question number four is, do you see our offering as distinctive from available solutions? It is, it tests whether what you are offering is indeed different. If not, maybe it is not different or maybe you did not convey it properly in your page one. Question number five. Now we are getting to an interesting part, how to test the possible price. And how to test the... Of course, our price has to be lower than willingness to pay of the customers, but as close to willingness to pay as possible. But if you are asking about willingness to pay directly, the customers are very unlikely to answer you. First, because they have no clue themselves, and even if they have the clue, they, um, they have no incentive to give you the truth. So if you say, I have this nice, cool, superior pen, how much would you be willing to pay for this pen? you cannot rely on any quality of those answers. Instead, the rule of thumb in validating the business models when you are testing the willingness to pay is to ask about similar current solutions to the problem. So how, how much would you be willing to pay for our offering as compared to products and services that you are using now? That's the whole trick. So instead of saying, well, this is, for example, a Parker pen, and then you show a Mont Blanc pen, which is more expensive, clearly show that your Mont Blanc pen is more expensive because it is, for whatever reason, it is more expensive, and then uh, ask, are you willing, how much would you be willing to pay for my Mont Blanc pen in, comparing to your current solution? Nothing, which basically means they don't care about what you're offering, much less, slightly less, same, slightly more, much more. This is the way to get a uh, price point comparing to competitors, comparing to substitutes. Never ever ask how much are you willing to pay for this pen in dollar amount. Ask how much are you willing to pay for this pen comparing to what you're currently using. Of course, uh, the next uh, questions, question number six and seven, seven asks about how much are you paying for current solution. So how often do you buy and then how much do you spend? So. Let's, let's imagine again, let's get back to this uh, pen example. So if you have a standard high-end pen and you are introducing something which is much more high-end, explain how your pen is better than current solutions. <coughs> then in question number five, ask whether customers are willing to pay, how much are they willing to pay for your pen comparing to current solutions? And then in question number six and seven, try to figure out or just figure out how much customers are currently paying for their current pens. 
So how often do you buy and then how much do you spend each time you make a purchase? This will give you ideas. This is one of the best ways to get customers willingness to pay. Then question number eight and question number nine, eight is where is the best place to buy? which give, will give you some ideas about where customers are usually buying. Question number nine is where do you get information about product service? It is obviously about who informs, who are essentially the decision makers or who helps the customers to make decisions about uh, purchase of your product or service. And it will give you ideas about where to advertise, how to get access to your customers. Question number 10, the last one. How likely is that you would be willing to buy our offering once it is available, from very unlikely to very likely. This, this question is quite often used in marketing research. And there is a lot of doubts about the accuracy of this question. So there is intentions actions gap. Customers say that they are intending to buy once your thing is available, but ultimately they don't walk their talk. But this question is still interesting because this question essentially gives us the upper limit so if out of 100 customers, 80 said that uh, they were likely or very likely to buy our product once it is available, it is, it is very unlikely that in real life we will get over 80. It is the upper boundary. We will get 80 or lower. I would put something like half, half of those people who are likely and very likely uh, into your financial projections. So, um, for example, if out of 100 people, 80 said that they were likely and unlike, very likely, I would say that in real world, 40 will actually buy your product. But of course, this comes with experience. At the very least, you will get from question number 10, you will get upper boundary estimation of your potential market. Uh, I deliberately called this list of questions incomplete. Usually you have something about 10 or 12 questions in your survey, so you can add additional things that are relevant to your particular entrepreneurial venture. But key things in these questions that I offer are all about, um, they will allow you to see how many people have the problem, how many people are unhappy with the current solutions. Uh, my questions will give you some ideas about how to get customers willingness to pay indirectly through comparing to substitutes. And then you will also get ideas about uh, your best sales channels and your best ways to advertise. So, of course, feel free to adjust these questions, but just, just an example, this will go. Now, let me get back to idea about getting the best evidence for success of your venture in the future. This is limited rollout. This is the running the pilot. If there is a way for you to run a small scale experiment, pilot as a small scale experiment to prove the viability of your venture, you should definitely do it. So if you want to create the next Uber in whole Canada, start in a small region, like, I don't know, district in Toronto, see how it works. And then you will get all the things that you need, things like validating the value proposition, price and cost of customer acquisition. Everything will be proven by real revenues. That's what we are looking for. Now, if we are selling something tangible, for example, some product that you can easily explain to customers, uh, you can always create a online, small online store using Shopify, for example, something that five, 10 years ago was much more expensive. Now you can get a basic uh, e-commerce website for $29 a month. You can buy some traffic on your website using Facebook or using Instagram or whatever else is the way you're getting your customers to your website. And you can actually test what is your cost of customer acquisition? You can offer different prices and see the elasticity of demand. You can validate the value proposition by just uh, changing the characteristics of your product that you explain on your e-commerce website. And by this means, see what your customers actually want. And so on and so on. So limited rollout or pilot is a crucial way to test. Sooner or later, once you, you get to raising the money from corporate funds or from venture capitalists, you will need to show that actually your model is already working. 
and uh, all you need you need the money in order to scale up and successfully validate the business model. Limited rollout or pilot is the way to do that. Then, crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and similar uh, platforms, even though they were initially developed in, to allow the new venture founders um, to um, essentially get initial money for finalizing the development of their product, uh, and then the backers would get this product. Right now, these platforms are used more and more widely as the way to validate your value proposition and validate your price. So if you have an idea about something tangible uh, that can be sold through Kickstarter or Indiegogo, test it there and see how it works. See how many backers you can get at this price. And this gives you the bulletproof argument because people put their money into, rather than just saying how likely they are to purchase this from you, they will put their money in order to back up your venture. So, in the summary, business model validation is the essential part of any entrepreneurial project, of any entrepreneurial process. Business model validation is all about testing the key assumptions that underpin your business model. And the more you do validation, the less uncertainty is left in your entrepreneurial project and the, the higher the value of your project is. So, business model validation, simple but not easy. Most of your time you will spend on validating your business model, not on writing the business plans, not on getting financial projections. All of this is important, but most of the things you will get, uh, most of the time you will spend on validating your business model. If you hear uh, terms like Lean Startup Movement or Get Out of the Building, it is all about let's plan less and validate more. Sometimes too much, but ultimately you still cannot underemphasize the importance of business model validation.